Welcome to the Sport Exchange with me, John Robbie. Hi guys, welcome to the Sport Exchange podcast where we meet sporting personalities and learn about their lives and their life stories. Today, the Sport Exchange podcast hosts another incredible story from losing a junior contract with the Sharks, playing for the Mighty Elephants, and even playing club rugby in Johannesburg with Pirates to leading the Springboks. It is quite a journey. Warren Whiteley, welcome and thanks for talking to us. Cheers, John. Thank you. How are you at the moment? How is the body? Very well. Um, Playing this weekend, so very excited uh, to get back on the park. And I mean, it's been tough the last year and a half or so. Um, since that um, game against France. Mm. Um, what actually happened? I damaged my obturator nerve and uh, had pubic symphysis as well. And yeah, Are just... you a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> you must feel like a doctor these I, days. Yeah, it, was, it was tougher, John. I mean, um, I knew something wasn't right, but I kind of, you what know... What did it feel you... like? What did the injury feel like? Obviously, it started in my groin. So it started in my groin and it, it was almost like a niggle. It felt like a niggle. And, so it um, wasn't a specific moment. It, was it wasn't just, a yeah. specific moment. And there was obviously a lot of pressure on us. Uh, if you think back at that time, a lot of pressure on the Springboks mm. to perform. Um, Alistair, there was, a, yeah, it was just a lot of pressure. I got announced as captain and I, I wanted to play. And, you know, you, you do everything you can. You take painkillers, you inject, you do whatever you have to. And um, unfortunately, after that second game, I could feel it just went from probably zero to 100 very quickly. And I knew something was wrong. Didn't train the whole week. And then Thursday, tried to train. And um, it just was a really odd feeling, almost like a like a shooting pain down mm-hmm. my leg. And by the Saturday, I heard it on the Thursday, we decided um, I wasn't going to play. And by the Saturday, I could hardly walk. Couldn't turn in bed. Couldn't lie down. I had to sleep, basically sitting up in bed for a couple of weeks. And um, went to see specialists had an operation, um, sportsman's groin operation, and which is usually six weeks. And after six weeks, I couldn't build any strength. There was no strength whatsoever. And had to, you know, we were rushing around, you know, doctors, with, they couldn't give me answers. So I had to go see another specialist who did these um, nerve conductor tests and found that my obturator nerve on my right leg was about 60 or 70 percent um, less than mm. on my left side and I couldn't build strength and he couldn't tell me give me a time frame um, which was pretty scary and um, it took about seven and a half eight months eventually built enough strength to be able to play and it's been a bit rocky since played about mm. nine games got back into uh, played in Japan five games Four in Super Rugby, and in the fourth game, then I tore my PCL grade two. Um, again, missed a lot of the Super Rugby. Came back just for the playoffs. Played, and now, um, you know, did a, a little bit of a groin tear, grade one, just a bit of a niggle. So the last year and a half has just been up and down, eh, John? What does that do to your mind? It's 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 tougher. I feel sorry for my wife, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like a roller coaster of emotions. I mean, if I think back. My son was born. I was announced as Springbok captain. It was just unbelievable. We, we did really well in that, that um, series against France. Yes. And um, then came my injury. Out for seven and, a, seven and a half, eight months. Get back on the road. Playing. Um, did you ever think, I'm never going to get back to the level um, I was at? I knew I was going to get back, but I, I must say I was worried that I wouldn't get back to the level where I was before. I had doubts. I definitely had doubts. I mean, I can't, I can't deny. And, and what, what do you do with those doubts? Because obviously, you're in a very precarious mm, career. Yes. Let's be honest. For all the glamour yes. and living yes. the dream and so on, yes. it literally can end in a tackle, yes. or in your case, a, yes. a bad groin injury, yes. etc. What is, what does that do to your perceptions of the rest of your life? It's scary, you know, having a wife and and, and two kids, and you you. Start thinking about plans after and rugby. earning a good living at the yes, at the moment, of course, yeah, definitely, and, and planning for the future and how much longer do I have? Um, look, my faith plays a huge, mm. huge role um, in, in that, but it's it, it's still scary. It, it, it's very scary, and it's it, it's a daily thing. To be honest with you, I mean, daily you have to remind yourself, um, you know that. It's going to get better. It will get better um, because you you can easily slip back into that black hole of doubt and negativity very, very, very quickly. 
so it's a daily thing it's a daily reminder um i, I mean i used to i stuck um, a little message um you know a little verse in my car that i would daily look at and um, from the bible from the bible yeah. yes that i would daily you know look at daily just to remind myself because I mean, that's how quick, it's not just a daily thing, it can be an hourly thing. It can yeah. be a minute thing. I mean, literally one minute I feel this way and the next minute I'm, I'm, have, I'm negative or I'm down. Um, so it's, it's, it's not easy, but you need to have things in place. And I mean, I'm fortunate enough to be in an environment um, at the union, at the lines of, of people that um, are positive. I, w- I was going to ask you about that because, um, I mean, what sort of support do you get from the Springboks, the South yeah. African Rugby uh, Union, and uh, and the Lions, because it must be very lonely. You're the yes. the centre of attention. You're basically running the show along with the coach, mm. and then suddenly you're on the outside. So, mm. so how do they keep you involved? How do they keep you motivated? The biggest biggest roles is with your union. I mean, that's where you spend most of the time, John. You know, with um, the box, it's it's pretty much in and out. Mm. And um, we're very fortunate to have some amazing people at the union. Um, Yanni Pitter, who uh, works with us um, as a psychologist, and uh, he's just unbelievable. And he has put amazing things in place. And I mean, one thing that we do have is if anyone gets injured, we um, you get almost um, like a little piece of paper and uh, something you have to say every day. So we have a verse as, as the lines that we have to say daily. But as you, when you get injured, you also have like a little verse that go in the line of that I won't let this injury get the best of me. I will come back stronger. Mm. It's just a, it's a something you say daily. Um, and we have something like that at the Lions as well that, that we challenge each other with because we see him generally on Tuesdays and we just talk. We talk about rugby. We talk about life. Is, is that compulsory? Do you have to speak to him? Um, it, it's a team session, yeah. but you can also see him individually. Yeah. And but we have team sessions, so um, we have a verse that we say, which is, "I'm the lions. I shall represent with the pride wherever I go, because I'm focused and disciplined. I play with passion, courage, and joy, and I do it to the best of my ability. I make wise decisions, am fearless, and love pressure, because I know where my strength and wisdom comes from. So it's just something we say." Um, weekly, daily, um, as as a team, as a squad, as a a group, as a union, and he has implemented different strategies. And it's it's not just rugby based; mm. it's life, life based. And we are very, very privileged to have that at the union. So, what do, what do new players feel when they come into this? I mean, you know, the, the Lions have have gone from being this bunch of gypsies who suddenly became perhaps the second best province in the world. Let me put it that way. Three finals. We all know the story. And when they come in, they find that there's this very basic philosophy, Mm. ethical Mm. background, bedrock of the team. What do outsiders feel when they come in? It's funny that you asked me that, Nick. I actually asked Nick Groom recently. Yeah, classic example. Yeah, He just joined the Lions and I asked him, does he... Do you feel anything different? Is it is it really different when you actually join the yeah. Lions? And his face just lit up. And he was like, Waza, you won't believe how different it is here. It's just unbelievable. And, the, you know, after chatting for five minutes, I think the biggest thing was uh, that he told me was, as an individual, with all your difference, you are embraced here. Mm. So you are not forced to be a certain way or to think a certain way. You are embraced for who you are. Well, what if what, what, what if a player came in who was not just non-religious, was yes. irreligious, was sacrilegious, Perfect. was came in and was a hooligan, whatever, yes. and felt that the the spiritual base because yes. we know the Lions has a spiritual yes. base. The spiritual base is all yes. nonsense. How yes. would you deal with that? Would that player last? I think so because it's it's we are all. We are all spiritual. We are not all religious, mm. but we are all spiritual uh, within us. We have we have spirit, and even if we don't admit it, even if we don't yeah. ad- admit it, I mean there, there is spirit within us, and I think that that's the connection. Yeah, um, it, it's it's not about religion. Um, it, it's about connecting to that spirit, connecting to your as a to you as a human. Yeah, to you as a human being, and I think that's what we try and 
to tap into at, at the Lions, you know, and we want to create a platform where you can have courage to stand up and talk about anything, not just rugby, hmm. but life. Where did that come from? Was this Ackerman? Did this come from Johan Ackerman? I would, I would say Coach, Coach Aki's had definitely had the biggest... Because uh, I'm fascinated. I don't know him at all, believe it yes. or not. I've sort of missed him on my career <laughs> and I've seen him. Yes. And, you know, you stereotype and you think this big, dumb lock forward <laughs> who ha- had problems with steroids when he was young, made yes. some silly mistakes. And I thought, oh my goodness, what is this man coming into the Lions for? Yes. It's going to be back dumb bo- and look what's happened. Yes. I mean, what what makes him so special? Exactly that is... He has been through a lot of struggles in his life. He has been to the lowest of the low. And he has understanding of all backgrounds, you know, and people Mm. and making mistakes. Um, And I think that understanding, having played there before as a Springbok, having been banned for two years, um, you know, having played, having to play club rugby, having to go work and then having a dream of playing for the Springboks again and being one of the oldest. Mm, I think, the until, Vic, 30, until Victor, yes, 37, wasn't yes, it? Yeah. 37. Yeah. And I mean, he's got a, a wonderful story as well. Um, and I think as a coach, he wanted to implement uh, not just a, a culture, as people say, but an environment mm. where players can, can be the best that they can be and feel comfortable with who they are, regardless of religion um regardless of culture Mm. regardless of anything just an environment where they can express themselves be themselves and push themselves and um you know we obviously we that's what we do we we play rugby um but the greater picture is is not that it it sounds very like saracens in a different way that of the two and i know some of the new zealand unions have also got a very much a, a sort of a mental spiritual personal side of things as yes, well yes. are more rugby outfits starting to adopt this this because obviously success goes with it is this something you're noticing in rugby in general that there is a more broad philosophy involved in it i believe so i mean that's it, it was it was interesting you know the, i mean every team has a has a different way of approaching it but we know that some call it culture team mm. environment i mean um, call it what you may, but there is, it's important. We know it is important, whether that's connecting to the history, uh, to the past, um, but you need, there needs to be something greater than just winning. Mm, mm. It can't just be, we need to win. It's going to be a higher purpose. It has somewhere. to be a higher purpose, a connection. Um, and I mean, that's what I believe drives sustainable um high performance because high performance is long-term success mm. and not short-term success so i think as as a you can have short-term success for instance uh, in a dictatorship if you look in the history i mean uh, hitler um in, in sport as well uh, someone can come in and be a dictator and you can have short-term <laughs> success definitely but yes. I, I, I can promise you you're not going to have long-term success yeah. Fas- fascinating stuff T- tell us i mean your, your story is unbelievable i mean you when did you fall in love with rugby how old were you what 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 Six made you love old. rugby Six. do you remember why or what made you love rugby People, friends, uh, my dad. My dad made me fall in love with the game. Was he a player? He used to play, uh, but he was a supporter. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, he didn't play when when I was younger, but he loved it passionately, loved Natal. Um, He loved the Springboks. We used to wake up early in the morning and watch them play in New Zealand and Australia. He used to wake me up um, and walk down the passage. And I I can remember his his ankles used to creak. My, My dad's ankles or his knees. And I can vividly remember in the morning <laughs> sleeping and I could, before he even wakes, because I'm anticipating, I'm, I'm already excited. Yeah. I mean, the Springboks are playing the All Blacks and I could hear his knees and his ankles creaking and him just giving me a shake and saying, Boyki, um, the game is starting in five minutes. Come, You can't miss the haka. Come come yeah. watch. Yeah. And then get up and, and I'll go watch, go, go watch the raga with my dad. So it was, I grew up as a, a, a rugby lover, a supporter, someone who watches rugby and loves rugby first what, but, before a player but but when you started to play because i know you played in the backs when you were when you were young yes. i mean obviously a dream of playing did you ever think you were going to play at top no, level no 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 i i loved rugby yeah. first 
my, my f- and, and still do that that is it's my passion it's what I love and I, I was fortunate enough to grow up with that love and I had my dad with me that kind of instilled that uh, within me that passion and that love for the game and when when did you when did you start to feel I can be good because obviously you made Craven week with Natal yes you? um that was pr- at under 16, <clears throat> I was still playing in the backs and I was sent to wing fullback. I mean, I pretty much played anywhere and I used to play on a Sunday, I used to play for Harlequins. Yeah. On a Saturday, I used to play for the school. And I remember under 16, I was playing in the B team at, at, at Leonard High School and uh, I used to be a backline player. And my coach at Harlequins told me, yes, um, you know, I, I think you need to play flank because um, I loved running. Yeah. I've, I've always loved running. I used to love athletics. My dad used to coach me. I used to love cross country as well. And I used to love training. I used to love playing. I used to love training. I used to love running. I just, I loved it. I loved playing. <laughs> I loved playing touch, anything with a ball. Yeah. And he told, and, and he just came to me and said, look, go play flank because you've got a great engine. Just run around, just just chase the ball, basically. That's mm. what he told me. I'm gonna put you open side, just chase. Chase the ball wherever you go. And um, that's where I really started growing in belief. I moved to flank, I got dropped at, at, um, at Glenwood because um, I told the coach, look, I would love to play flank. I'm really enjoying it there. Mm. And he told me, well, unfortunately, um, we have good flankers which I did at the time and I played for the B side and eventually the next year I, I, I managed to work myself up and, and played for the first side in, in, in 2014 um, at Glenwood at flank and that's when a little bit of belief, what year was that that was 2014 uh, t- sorry, 2004. I was going to say, gee whiz, sorry, I mean, sorry, 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 2004. 2004. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's when a lot of belief um, started growing within me. And then uh, uh, physically, had you, had you uh, sprung no, up at that stage? No, I was, I mean, I've, I was still in, I was probably about 87, mm. um, 88 at most yeah. when I played Craven Week. And I remember going through that Craven Week, you know, you get that booklet. And I mean, it's a big thing for you as a youngster. You know, you go through that booklet and you always look at height and weight. Yes, I mean, yes, yes. I'm <laughs> still fascinated you, by it. Yeah. You always look at height and weight. And I promise you 90% are not true. I can promise you that. <laughs> because <laughs> if you if, if you 188, you 191. Yeah. If you 195, you're two meters. Yeah. And if, you, if you're 87 <laughs> kgs, you're, you're definitely in the 90s. Yeah. Um, but look, I was I, I probably on the program. I'll admit I was probably a ni- ninety kgs, but in reality I was 87, <laughs> 87 kgs. And if someone had to take one look at me, they would see I wasn't in the nineties. How did you do at Craven Week? Um, I was a, a hard working player. I was yeah, a good player. Yeah. I wasn't a great player. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you know, I was a hard working open mm. side flanker. Pretty much just chased mm. the ball, tackled mm. and rucked. Mm. Um, I was I was scared. To make mistakes mm. at, at that that age i was i was scared to make mistakes i was scared with ball in hand i was worried about m- making errors i didn't mm. want to make i didn't want to let the team down so mm. i was, I was mm. at that age i was i was very scared but i i loved i loved the game i mm. absolutely loved it and and, and they should go, go to the sharks academy because i mean yes. we, we don't have sort of unlimited time what was it like when you were dropped from the academy? I mean, we know it was Rudolph who had to drop yes. you, ironically. <laughs> yes. I mean, had you an inkling about it or did you get summoned to an office? Tell, tell us how it's done where you lose a, a contract. I was I was in the Super Rugby squad in the Curry Cup squad with the Sharks and they had great players and mm. I was just wasn't getting a shot and um, went to Rudolph and asked if I can be released. I was playing club rugby for... Oh, so you Jones. asked him? Well, there was an opportunity yeah. to play first division and yeah. I felt instead of not playing and holding bags let me go play first division which is at a higher level than club rugby mm. and um it was a great opportunity i'd heard of cheeky watson and there were a lot of rumors and the i was mighty a elephants. scared yeah, yeah i was yeah i heard some you know some rumors about him and i you know went went there and i thought let me just try playing at a high level than whatever because i haven't played curry cup i haven't played super rugby i've only yeah. played club rugby and sharks 15 at that so which is wildebeest um so let me go try this, this is at a high level so i went uh, i went there and cheeky watson 
he didn't even greet me. He just shook my hand and he said, the first thing he, he said to me was, Warren, if you don't perform for us, I'll make sure that you don't play at any other union ever again. The, <laughs> that's the first thing he told Motivational me. stuff. The first eh? thing, yeah. he didn't say hello, thank you. Not, yeah. He looked me in the eye and he said, if you don't perform for us, I'll make sure you don't play at any other union ever again. And I was like, gee, Okay, so I'm, I mean, I'm 22 years old. Yeah. Um, I'm already scared as it is. Um, and I, I played for the elephants and I really enjoyed it there. I enjoyed the lifestyle, PE, it's an amazing time. And went back to the Sharks, as Rudolf said, I'm, I, I must come back and then we'll discuss my future. Mm. Sat with Rudolf and he told me, look, um, he can't offer me anything. They've got a lot of loose forwards, and I'm at this stage. I'm just not. I'm just not good enough. How did you feel at that moment? It was, yeah, it was tough. Be- my dream was to play for the Sharks. Yeah. I mean, my my dad loved Natal. He had DVDs of 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 the great uh, '90s when Natal won the Curry Cup. I mean, Henry Honeyball was my my hero. Um, it was. It, that, that was my love and my passion and my dream. Did you cry? Be- before, did you, did you before, cry when he told you? Did you cry? Did tears come? Yes. I, well, not there. The, yeah. the, not there, but the, definitely. Because I didn't know what to do. I didn't have a plan. Yeah. Put it that way. I didn't have a plan. That My plan was to play play for Natal. And, and, and you studied as well, had you? you, you yes, studied? I was. Uh, I, I did marketing at the Sharks Academy, but yes. I also was... In, in, in Poch for for a short stint and came to the Sharks swaced the brain yes um, yeah, then yeah. was it the academy so did you get a qualification or, or had yes, you, 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 uh, at least you had something to, yes. and did you ever consider giving up professional rugby no I yeah. didn't because, follow your dream yes and my dad told me that I have to give it everything I yeah. have to give don't it don't die abs- wondering yes and I knew I knew that I, I was a hard worker and I just needed an opportunity and that opportunity came in, in Dick Muir, who gave me an opportunity at the Lions, who then got offered a head coach um, job at the Lions and, and, and asked me, look, would I like to come to Joburg? Sin City. How did you feel about that? Because I know when you were young, you regarded Johannesburg as a, a different country. Completely, completely a different country, John. I mean, we used to tour there when I played for Harlequins. And I mean, just the bus trip up there, it felt like, going to a different world, the weather was different. I mean, the traffic, the people, it just it, it was completely out of my mm. comfort zone. A, a little boy coming from the bluff, short and, and barefoot. I mean, I, I used to walk, walk barefoot foot until the age of 15. My sister wouldn't, I, we used to go to macro w- with my dad. That was an outing, going to macro and do the monthly shopping. <laughs> and because they had a great sports section there. Yeah. And I used to play with all the sporting, sporting equipment and, yeah. and, and dream of playing for the box. And, and, um, that used to be an outing. I used to walk barefoot and my sister refused to walk walk next to me because I didn't <laughs> want to put shoes on. And so, I mean, it's just completely out of my comfort zone going going to Johannesburg. And it just worked out that my, my dad moved there a couple of years prior mm. because of work and I was in the boarding establishment at, at Glenwood, finished off there. And it, it just worked out that my parents was there were there, my sister was there and I had a support structure because things didn't go well you got injured didn't you and yes. you, as i mentioned in the introduction you ended up yes. having to play club rugby i mean yes. pirates is a great club but yes. it wasn't quite where your ambitions lay yes uh, i was in the super rugby squad and got a grade two hamstring injury and i was out for a couple of weeks and i had to play um, club rugby for for pirates which i also thoroughly enjoyed and um dick i mean that was a tough year i don't think we won the super rugby game I think, yeah, I think we mm. lost every single Super Rugby game. Dick Muir got released and John Mitchell arrived. Um, what was that like? What was that like? I know John and I know he's a very strange individual. What yes. was it like when he arrived? Um, again, we had heard, you know, a lot of rumors and I, I knew him from um, coaching the force when I was at the Sharks. We trained against the force as juniors at the Sharks and he was a head coach. And I obviously saw the reports um, of, you know, the controversy between him and the players mm. and at the force. And so we all as players knew that he, he, he came there with a bit, with a bit of a reputation um, as a dictator. And um, we soon realized, well, it, it took about a year or so that um, in the beginning, it was great, John. I mean, he is, he is a rugby 
brain like no other. Mm. I mean, his technical ability, second to none. Um, amazing a rugby brain. And also an, as an individual, he bettered me as a player, mm. 100%. And he pushed me to, to be a better player in person. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that. Um, we did quite well in that Curry Cup season. Super rugby, it, 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 it was tough. Uh, I think when the pressure was on... Um, he started, ch- admittedly so, and he would admit this openly. I mean, I know John very, mm. well, very well. And he started changing. He started... Um, bullying? P- bullying. Um, personally attacking us as individuals. So uh, as uh, that's when it got tough. When we as a team would, would see it happen in front of us. Mm. And... Um, yeah, you know, it was... It, it, you know, I laugh now. <laughs> it's funny now, but... <laughs> I remember he had an office and, and the team room and his office was just around the corner and we would all sit in the team room and he would always come in. And now, you know, we can, I mean, we weren't winning games. I mean, we won, I think, enough. we won about three games mm. or two games. So on a weekly basis, guys would get dropped or the team would change. And we would all sit in the team room and um, he, would, he would come in the room and then we would all just get silent. And then he would just, you know, he'd call you in front of everyone. So you would be sitting there and he'd say, like, Warren, um, just see me in my office. And, and you know, I mean, he doesn't, you know what's going to happen. Yeah. So, he, you know, you sit down and then he'll, you know, he'll tell you, look, you're just, you're just not good enough. I'm, I'm sorry. You know, you, you just, you're not going to play this weekend. Uh, sorry about that. And you'll walk in and, I mean, everyone will be looking at you and, you kind of just, it almost feels like a walk of shame. You know, I was you, gonna say, you an sit, execution, yeah. Yeah, you kind of sit down and everyone pretty much knows what's happening. Um, but anyway, look, there were a lot of things that happened, a lot of what things is, that I what broke the What broke the back? Because no one's ever really spoken about it. I know him and Kevin, Kevin was, yes. was involved in it yes, and it went yes. to court. But, but what, what was the incident that broke the, the there, camel's back? Oh, or was there, there were a lot of, yes, there were a lot of inc- uh, things that happened on the field with, with younger players and... Um, things you know it's difficult to talk about it now but but I mean did you stand up did the senior yes, players so, stand up so basically it, it got to a point where the senior players Vikas van Heerden Kobus Groblar uh, Dobis Le um guys just saying look this is just can't go on like this anymore mm. it's it, it, you know something needs to change and um, we could feel it happening as, as, as a youngster then uh, you know I was kind of in the shadows you know um in the, in the background and I didn't have the courage to stand up mm. I, I just didn't have the courage to do it and the senior players stood up against them and there were you know court cases and and yeah soon after we were basically left uh, coach Johan Ackerman was was the assistant coach um, with with John at the time and, and, and there was no one else pretty much to take over and, and coach Johan didn't have any other experience being a head coach can yeah. you believe it um and he took over. And and started the process and that started you the process. I mean, it, it really is an unbelievable story. What's yes. it like facing the Harker for the first time? Unbelievable. <laughs> it's, I mean, as, as I played a, against the All Blacks twice yes. and never faced a Harker. Because really? in those days, they were almost ashamed of it. They only did it at away test matches. Oh, wow. And I played in New Zealand against them and I played Captain Cambridge University again. Yes. So I never faced a Harker, but I played against the All Blacks twice. Yes. What, what is it actually like? It's amazing. I mean, it's a, it's a challenge. And it's a challenge for you as an individual and as a team. That, that's what I see it as. And I see it as tradition. I see it as history. So I, 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 I love it. I absolutely love it. Watching, growing up, watching it and then yeah. standing there is, is quite surreal. And does it make you think, does it, 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 we know it focuses obviously the All Blacks, but I imagine it makes you focus as well in a funny way. It can actually be a positive thing for you facing it. It's a huge positive facing Mm. it because you can feel the guys getting energy from it. You can feel the team and individuals um, gaining energy from the haka. Um, Just to, you know, go, go back a bit to something recent, it was the test match now they played against New Zealand. And you could feel the supporters in, in mm. Pretoria starting to sing Ole Ole Ole. And, and you, I, I mean, I couldn't even hear the Aka. Yeah. I mean, that, the energy, it, it, like you said, you gain a lot of energy from it. It's just, it's, it's fantastic. I, I was there. It, it was amazing. P- put us into perspective against the All Blacks now. Yes. We've had three games. I mean, how we lost this last one was, was 
it, we completely outplayed the All Blacks. And, and yet I suspect in a year's time we'll look back and say we learned valuable lessons about closing a game out, what, what, whatever. Put us into perspective where are the Springboks at the moment with a view to the World Cup next year. We are growing, I think, very quickly as a team. Um, there's definitely a belief within the squad, a lot of belief now. The turning point was in Wellington mm. when, when we beat the All Blacks in Wellington. Um, we, have, we, we saw during the rugby championship, um, even in, in, the, in some performances where people will argue against Argentina away and Australia when we lost, but when we analyzed the games and we looked at it and um, um, we looked at the opportunities we created, we knew that we were creating opportunities. Mm. We knew that we were our own worst enemy and there, were, there was belief within the group that even though we lost those two games, that we were developing as a side and we were actually improving, even though from the outside there was a lot of <laughs> criticism. Um, yes. And it might not have looked like improvement, but within our squad, the, there was belief that there was improvement. We are creating opportunities. Mm. And our defensive system was was growing and getting better. And again, that turning point was, was in Wellington. It was, it was like, like a, wave after wave of Kiwis. And yet the tackling was, mm. was amazing. I mean, it's my experience that sometimes if you have a brilliant defensive system, even though it is is is. The, the defense is desperate. It's never yes. panicky. Yes. You know, you're actually relaxed almost in defense because you've got so much confidence in the people yes. inside and, and yes. outside you. you. You understand what I'm saying? Did you feel that? Definitely felt that. You, you actually gain energy from it. Yes. You gain energy from them not getting momentum and stopping them. And a lot of, I, I know a lot of people will watch and, and they say, oh, but they're making a lot of tackles and um, they're going to tire out. But it, it, it also gives you energy. It also gives you energy when, when you defend and the opposition can't break through or they can't score points. Mm. And when you get the ball or make a turnover, then you use that energy and, and start attacking with the ball, which is, which is what we did. And I mean, Coach, Coach I must say, Coach Rossi has, has been brilliant. And from the start, he earmarked the all-black game. So from the start, he said, he told us the game he wants to win is in Wellington against the All Blacks from the start. Gee, people would he said, have that is the game. Yeah, yeah. That is the game. As a team, he stood in front of us and he is very open and honest. I mean, he had a, uh, he had a team sheet um, when we arrived in the camp. He had a team sheet against Argentina, home, Argentina away and Australia. So mm -hmm. he already had three games, who's going to play, who's not going to play in front of everyone. So he said... Warren, you're going to play here and here. Uh, this player, um, you're not going to play here. I'm going to arrest you, but I'm going to play you in, in New Zealand. Um, so he was extremely open and honest with everyone and in front of everyone, which I think is, is, is fantastic. Well, it, tie, it ties into what you, what you talked about earlier. But I mean, and I don't want to knock uh, Alistair Kutsia because he's a lovely guy, but yes, it, was, yes, it was a very difficult time. Yes. And you could almost argue that we've, wasted two years in the yeah. build-up now um, that sounds harsh but but i think people would know what i mean mm. have we got enough time to be competitive definitely. with the world cup definitely more than enough time so more than enough time uh, and what's rassi's secret <sighs> technically because i've heard i've heard i've heard all of that but i've also heard some people saying he's a bit of a head case you know and and you sort of worry because cert certain head cases can fool people Yes. along the way so so I want Rassi Erasmus from, from Warren Whiteley loves rugby lives mm. for like you for, lives for the game loves it passionately um, and he has got people around him if I think of Jock Nienaba mm. um, he is an unbelievable coach unbelievable coach unbelievable human being um, Zwandile stick Zwandile has grown immensely I mean, yeah. he's, he's been fantastic in his role at the, spring, uh, at the box. And Coach Swayze uh, de Brain has also been unbelievable. And I, You I sound quite knows. confident, are you? Uh, quietly confident? Quite, quietly confident. I mean, there are, there, there's definitely still areas we, we have to improve on, like, like you mentioned now, closing out yeah. games. And, yeah. But we, f we feel that we are growing uh, as a team and that growth is, is, is happening, happening rapidly and also within our team environment. Things are starting to happen. Belief, 
um, care for each other. So the, the similar yes. things that you identified yes. with the lions that made yes. it successful. Yes. Well, Warren, what, I mean, c- coming to the end now, I mean, you've signed a, a, a contract, thank goodness, with the Lions till after the World Cup. Yes. You've got to be looking overseas, are you? Um, I don't want to put you on the spot. No, no, no. You don't have to more than I mean, I'm completely honest. Yeah. This is how I, 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 yeah. I speak to my... We, we've spoken about this extensively about going overseas um, and my reasons for, for going overseas, that's, that's what I challenge myself. What, why, why am I going? Is it, am I going for money? Am I going for experience? Am I going for my kids, for my family, mm. my wife? And the, the money is, I, I can't go for money. That is completely... Really? I, it, it's just, I've spoken to my wife, that can't be the reason why I'm going. So I, I've told my wife, like, I can't, I can't make a decision just based on money. I can't yeah, just go, yeah. I'm going to play in France. Just, just, to, I, I just can't do it. It's, it's not right for me. And that's what makes this decision very difficult. You'd be unusual in that. I think a lot of players would say, you know, I've got to cash in. I've got um, to cash in at the end of my career in order yes. to set myself up for the future. Maybe, maybe I am a bit different, but I, I, think of my children so my, and, and my wife um, my kids I think of what I want to do after rugby um, I, I want to coach and um, I want to be involved in the game mm. I want to coach I want to contribute I want to make a difference in, mm. in players lives I mean that's that's what I want to do so you want to take this model this philosophical model if I can put it this higher purpose model all embracing model yes. and maybe develop that and yes. take that on to the next generation Yes, I, I want to contribute. I want to serve. That's yeah. that's what I'm going to do. And I, I I feel like I've been. There's a reason why I've been blessed to be in this in this position in this game, and why I have such a passion for for rugby. And I want to give back. And I always challenge myself on um, where should I be? Where am I meant to be? Um, and where can I have the biggest influence? And I don't know if the best thing for me would be to take my wife and my two kids and sign a two-year contract in France just to come back to South Africa yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's 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 a difficult decision for me at this stage, and one I haven't I haven't really made a decision yet. But I'm leaning towards actually staying in South Africa. Fantastic. Warren, great talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. Good luck with the injuries and good luck with your career. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. Wasn't that a fascinating chat about rugby and life in general? Thanks as usual to Slow in the City for hosting us. Check out the Course Restaurant next time you're in Santon. Well worth doing. Follow us on social media and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. See you next time. Cheers from John Robbie.